The following is a special presentation of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. This program is partially funded by the Lupin Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life in the community and the nation by supporting educational, artistic, and cultural endeavors. It's as if the ghosts of the great men who once passed through these halls had left a trace of their greatness behind them. river I abide my walls have heard a thousand stories history made memory stored I have seen days of glory and I have suffered indignities I have been home to hospital barracks and yes even prison I have been burned and abandoned and I have been restored once more like a phoenix from the ashes like the south itself I shall rise again From Baton Rouge, LPB presents Opening Night at the Old State Capitol, Louisiana's new center for political and governmental history. On these very steps, more than 140 years ago, a group of men and women gathered to dedicate a new capital building for the still youthful state of Louisiana. As they stood here filled with great pride and an overwhelming sense of accomplishment, I am sure they were also filled with great dreams about the future of our government and this living monument to its people. Tomorrow morning, another group of men and women will stand here on these steps and rededicate this structure, reopening it to the people as a center for political and governmental history. Much has been said and written about our unique political history. It has provided the framework for great literary works, Pulitzer Prize-winning biographies and fiction. It has also been the subject of award-winning movies and highly acclaimed documentaries. It is fitting that here in this place where much of our political history was written, where our political and governmental landscape was shaped and molded, that we should provide a place to tell our story privately to all the people of Louisiana and the world. Tonight, on the eve of our grand reopening, we begin to tell a part of that story with a very special symposium on Louisiana government. Welcome back, Louisiana, to your old state capitol building the Center for Political and Governmental History. Good evening and welcome. I'm Beth Courtney. We are here this evening in this beautifully restored house chambers of the old state capitol, where this evening we rededicate this building as a museum of political and governmental history. It is indeed fitting on this grand occasion and this evening that we begin the first symposium in this magnificently restored building as a governor's symposium, as we hear from former governors of the state of Louisiana about the role of the chief executive. And it is certainly fitting that we begin tonight with hearing from our current governor, a man who has already made history by being the only person elected to four terms as governor of the state of Louisiana. Let's welcome now Governor Edwin Edwards. Governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This building was the seat of government in Louisiana for almost 145 years, going back to the inauguration time of Governor Walker. Since that time, many momentous events have occurred here, 
in this building a convention met in 1861 to vote to succeed from the Union. In this building, fistfights broke out over the uh, scandals of the lottery in the late 1800s. <laughs> in this building, uh, the only, uh, I hope the only, impeachment proceedings that were <laughs> instituted against a governor. Uh, many momentous events occurred in this old capital. I'm very pleased that at this moment in history, I happen to be governor of the state and can be here when we rededicate it. It has gone through fires and ravages of time and neglect and other things that we humans sometimes allow to happen for buildings which we sh about which we should be more careful. But I think it's a tribute to our Secretary of State, Fox McKithen, and his staff and those who were participating in the renovation and restoration of this building that we have it here today in its wonderful condition as a living monument of government in Louisiana for many, many years. You will be hearing in a few moments from <clears throat> a symposium or a forum of uh, living former governors of the state, all of whom I happen to know on a personal basis. Uh, you should stop to recognize as they talk to you how much they represent the diverse nature of the people of our state. They come from Shreveport and New Orleans and from the rural part of North Louisiana, Columbia, and other parts of the state. They are different in practically every way in personality, political philosophy, party registration. Yet somehow, at one point in time, they represented the consensus of the people of the state who chose each to serve as governor during the period of time during which he served. I think you will find some comfort in knowing that although we are a diverse people, that the governors now living and who have served us since 1940 represent every segment of our state and all aspects of our society. They represent the conservative philosophy at one time, or the populist philosophy at another, Republicans and Democrats. And in a way, it tells us that although we are diverse, there's something of a commonality about us, that we elect people to serve us to respect and re respond to the common good. And each of us in our own way, and certainly those from whom you will be hearing in a few moments, at the moment in history in which they were serving, rose to the challenges of the time and the occasions which were brought before them. Each of us, in one way or the other, had horrible decisions to make, important impacts upon the welfare and well-being of the people of the state. I know each of them on a personal basis. I know their triumphs and their failures, just as I knew my own, because in this business, it's impossible to always succeed. You have to strive. You have to attempt. You have to reach out sometimes further than the length of your arms. Sometimes you cannot touch the goals that you would like to achieve. Sometimes as leaders, we see ahead of our times and have a difficult time having people to follow us at the time. It is said that some of us are able to see further beyond the horizons because we stand on the shoulders of giants. These governors from whom you will hear at their times represented Louisiana in a fashion that met with the satisfaction of the people. We're all different, but we have a common interest in the welfare of our state. I hope in that spirit you will welcome them and listen to them and try to put yourself in their shoes as they reminisce over their terms as governor of the state of Louisiana. In my own instance, I happen to be proudly the first Cajun Catholic from South Louisiana elected governor in over 100 years. It was at the time uh, it occurred in 1972, thought to be an impossible feat. But it happened because all of a sudden, after years of division, some prejudice, some racial, some religious, all of a sudden the people of Louisiana came as one group into a new era and decided to put aside the old and the things that had once divided us, the imaginary things that people thought divided the people of the state, when we finally realized for once that for all the differences between us, there was more in common, that everywhere in the state people were looking for a better educational system, better roads, 
a better opportunity. They wanted to live in the best kind of neighborhoods that their livelihoods would make it possible for them to live. They wanted to give their children the best advantages possible. And wherever we have come from as governors, when we express the will of the people, regardless of our philosophy, somehow we managed to bring together a majority of the thinkers in Louisiana to achieve the progress that came in our various administrations. In my own instance, I was able to help write the first new constitution in over 50 years, and it remains even today a model of brevity and conciseness, and we're very proud of that. Those that, will, that followed me and preceded me in their own right achieved other things, some that I was unable to achieve, even, even though I felt at the time it might be the thing to do, but because of the circumstances or my own personality, or because the will of the people had not yet caught up with a concept, did not come to fruition until others who followed me or preceded me since this is now my fourth term. In any event, I think it's important that we in Louisiana recognize the gigantic efforts in restoring this building as we remember our past. For to know nothing of the past is to understand little of our present and have no conception of the future. And I think we can say with a great deal of pride that we look back with pride on the events that molded our state and brought us to this point in our history and that we can say from our recognition of the triumphs and failures of the past as will be memorialized in this building, we can go on to greater and better things for the future of our children. Thank you. Tonight, we are going to introduce to you the current former governors uh, after that, those wonderful remarks from our current governor. But first, we truly want to say and we miss you and pay a tribute to one of our governors who could not be with us this evening. Uh, he is uh, somebody who is very special and he is ill and we know he is watching and we hope that uh, he indeed recovers quickly. That is a very, he is a very special individual because most of us only dream of achieving fame and success in our chosen field. This governor is a remarkable man. He has served the state in the 40s and the 60s. In the 90s, he was elected to the Country Music Hall of Fame, and just recently, he was elected to the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. How did it all begin for this governor? Beach Springs, Louisiana at the turn of the century was about as country as you can get. James Houston Davis worked in the fields and attended school when his chores permitted. Well, I thought we were supposed to be dirt poor, sometimes hungry. Though it was rare for his time and place, he enrolled at Louisiana College in Pineville and paid for some of his education by strumming a guitar on the street corners of Alexandria. By 1926, Davis saved enough money to head for LSU, where he earned a master's degree in psychology. Back home, he started writing and singing songs on KWKH radio. Next, a Decca Records contract, a traveling band, and the beginnings of international acclaim. We'll bring a house bill to two, two. <laughs> the code of ethics not far. His musical popularity helped propel him from Shreveport legal clerk to the Public Service Commission to the governor's mansion. His themes were post-war prosperity and continuing government reforms. The state was blessed with abundant revenues, and Jimmy Davis left a surplus each time he left office. The 60s were a time of racial tension and conflict. Jimmy Davis's calm assurance contrasted sharply with the world around him in his second term. From 1960 to 64, Davis continued a significant building program, but perhaps we will always treasure most, his greatest gift to Louisiana and the world, a rich and enduring musical legacy. I owe a lot to Louisiana for helping Well,
Well, from the hills of North Louisiana comes our next two-term governor. He was such a commanding presence in the Louisiana political scene of the late 60s and early 70s that the name Big John just seemed appropriate. I'm John J. McKithen. When John McKithen took office as governor in 1964, he brought with him experience as a state representative, public service commissioner, and soldier in World War II. In 1945, he opened a law practice in Columbia, not far from his native Grayson. Three years later, he was elected to the State House. As Earl Long's floor leader, McKithen studied Louisiana politics. He was elected to Huey Long's old public service seat in 54 and again in 1960. There he helped regulate the phone company and kept the price of a call to a nickel. He virtually took that Long family from the Longs and uh, it gave him tremendous credentials with uh, uh, the Long faction, which was still substantial in Louisiana. He inaugurated a code of ethics and a board to enforce it. He helped end the patronage system by eliminating many appointed positions, and he worked tirelessly to attract modern industries to Louisiana. I'm not a man who views government as a necessary evil. I view it as a positive force. Foresight was also a McKithen trait. He sold the state on the idea of building a stadium in New Orleans, so big they would call it the Superdome. In his second term, McKithen reformed the corrections department and improved conditions at Angola. He developed employee insurance benefits, greatly expanded our system of highways, and passed the taxes to pay for it. With his campaign phrase, won't you help me, two-term governor John McKithen helped Louisiana into a new era of prosperity. Welcome now, Governor John McKithen. In modern times, we had never elected one. They used to say that the Republicans in Louisiana could meet in a phone booth. Well, our next governor changed all that and drastically altered Louisiana's political landscape. I want you to know that uh, David Treen, as an individual... Dave Treen was a different sort of governor. He was a Republican, the first elected since Reconstruction. But more than ending the Democrats' winning streak in Louisiana, Treen pursued a reform agenda of his own. David Connor Treen was born in 1928 in Baton Rouge. He graduated from a New Orleans high school and went on to receive undergraduate and law degrees from Tulane. He was a member of the Republican State Central Committee for most of the 60s and 70s. In 1972, Treen won a seat in Congress representing suburban New Orleans. Good hunting weather, huh? He served three terms in Washington that ran for governor in 1979. Infighting between the five major Democrats in the race was so bitter that four of his former opponents actually endorsed the Republican. Republican Dave Treen won the 1979 gubernatorial race. Making As governor, Treen passed an education program designed to pay better trained teachers more and hold them to higher standards. He worked out a plan for flood control and environmental protection in the Atchafalaya Basin. He gave the state a big tax break, but perhaps his greatest challenge was the state's money woes. Louisiana had depended on booming oil production in the 70s. Now that bounty was shrinking and fast. For much of Treen's administration, his attention to detail steered the state through some turbulent fiscal waters. In the end, we might do well to simply quote Dave Treen. Leadership is not demonstrated by flamboyance or glibness. It is demonstrated by accomplishments. Let us welcome David Treen. Come. In the 1980s, the New South called for new leadership. Ivy League degrees were the prerequisite in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Our next governor believed strongly in education, but he answered to the Southern name of Buddy. In 1987, the people in this state 
chose the road less traveled by. Charles Elson, Buddy Romer, has described his path to the mansion as a rocky road. From the start, though, he has worked hard. Raising ponies, raising horses, cattle, helping his grandmother uh, work cattle, working in the cotton fields. Uh, he can tell you very well how to chop cotton. Romer left his native Shreveport for Harvard at the age of 16. In 1967, he earned a master's degree in business and finance. When the governor called a constitutional convention, Romer answered as a delegate. In 1980, he was elected to the 4th Congressional District seat. The next three terms, he ran unopposed. In 1987, he ran for governor against a pack of better-known candidates, talking about scrubbing the budget and honor in government. He earned more votes than any challenger, and when the governor bowed out, Buddy Romer was elected. Too much money, too much corruption, too much double talk. We're better than our politics, folks. Romer used his term to support causes he knew the public wanted tackled. Teacher evaluation, setting up a wetlands trust fund, a highway trust fund, and a mineral revenue trust as well. He delivered on a promise to give more money and power to the Department of Environmental Quality. Under Romer's term, but despite his protestations, gambling emerged as a new revenue source. At times called stubborn, Romer is still regarded by many citizens as a visionary whose messages can motivate and inspire. Let us welcome Governor Buddy Romer. Well, it is a pleasure to have all of you here in this room, and we are anxious to, for posterity, record some of, the, some of your thoughts, because in this wonderful new uh, center for political and governmental history, uh, I think for the next generations, for school children, we certainly want to preserve some of your thoughts. And when I was um, thinking about what we might kick off with, uh, certainly, we in Louisiana seem to have a unique fascination with politics and politicians. Why do you think that is so? Do you think they would have a museum like this in Iowa? <laughs> Why do we have a fascination with politics and politicians in Louisiana? Let me just interject this, that in 1983, they had no fascination with me whatsoever. <laughs> Are we different in Louisiana because of our colorful past? Governor McKithen, what do you think? Well, perhaps to some extent. <laughs> uh, North Louisiana is part of Arkansas. <laughs> and Mississippi. South Louisiana is a world almost to its own. The great metropolitan area of New Orleans, of course, is different from anything in America. <laughs> and uh, you take those three together, it makes a pretty good brew. And to get half of those three conglomerates is quite a task. Uh, I don't think we're different from most everybody else in America. I think we're a little more vigorous and a little brighter than most of the rest of America. <laughs> I think we demonstrated time after time. We had the greatest general of the Marine Corps ever produced from Louisiana, for example. Had the Commandant of the Corps. We had Major General Graves Erskines. I live within about three miles of where General Erskine was born and reared. We've done pretty well in the industrial world as been demonstrated here tonight. I went to try to get the Texaco company to build a refinery at the Sunshine Bridge. The man I was introduced to was a native Louisianian, a graduate of Louisiana State University. The president, Howard Ramon, same part of the state that Mr. Cook is from. And we've done, we've done pretty well, all in all. Russell Long honored this state in the great distinctive position he held. I just think we're a little better than most of the people around. All right. <laughs> Now, 
Governor Romer, that's pretty hard to top. You want you want to <coughs> jump in here? <laughs> well, I'll give a North Louisiana answer to that. Amen. He's Amen. right. <laughs> I might mention for our uh, televi television audience that uh, uh, Lod Cook, the president of ARCO, is who you were making reference yeah. to, who is here with us this evening. I'm sure he knew and, that you were him. And uh, uh, he has had been so much a part of making the old state capital come about. Well, certainly tonight we want to talk about the tremendous, um, the job, if you will, of being governor. And certainly in Louisiana, the governor has, had, has been a very powerful office. Was until Edmund got that new constitution. What you said is I had to, when I was governor and the second term thing came up, actually that wasn't my idea. But my opponents came out against it and it forced me to be for it. I'd been much better off politically than otherwise if it had never passed. <laughs> Really? So, so you're saying after the new constitution, uh, they the whole took idea. The new con but before even the constitution was passed, much of the power of the governor was stripped from him by former governor Sam Jones. I appointed him to committee to tell us if the governor had too much power. And since Governor Jones w was a great reform governor, of course, of all times, <laughs> he didn't think the governor had too much power. <laughs> and he came up with his recommendations and didn't take many powers away from us. But Edmund and the other governors, David and Buddy, they say, Governor, why don't you lead? Well, you haven't got anything to lead with. Do, do you, you don't have any appointments to hand out to your dear supporters and friends who are all interested in good governor, good government, Governor Edmonds. And uh, taking power away from the governor is not in the interest of good government. And I told Ed Stagg this and debated with him hour on hour. You're a much better chance of getting one good man than you are getting a whole host of good legislators. <laughs> it, well, now, now, it takes something to lead those legislators. We have done it, Edmund. Now, uh -huh. now Governor, these two men, these two men pull that as well as I do as Edmund did. Let, let's, uh, now, Governor Romer, you certainly uh, had difficulty with Why the legislature. Wait a minute, you on me? Yourself. I'm just listening. <laughs> Get an education. Certainly, we. Governor we, McKithen used to call me in my brief term of office on occasion when I was in a big pickle, and he'd give me that speech. It was a great speech, John. I really. <laughs> he got that like thunder. You the man. Well, the candidate and, gets pretty lonely in there as governor, doesn't yeah, it, Edmund? It does. <laughs> when you're right, or when it looks like you're right, oh my, 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 my. But did, did things you, don't don't go right, it gets pretty lonely. Did there. you all ever talk to <laughs> <laughs> Did you all talk to one another? Did you ever did you give advice? You gave advice? David Trey pointed me on the LSU board of supervisors. I believe you did, Edmund, too. And buddy, I'm, didn't you, too? I, yeah, I, I don't think I'm so. I'm not honored for all three times. I did it. All right, let's go back in history a little bit. And I'd like to hear from... I just uh, listened to your speeches, John. What you, My wife said to me not to say another word. She just gave me the thumbs down. We are here in the uh, chambers where Huey Long served. Huey Long served as governor in this building. A lot of people, of course, associate him more with the new capital that he built. But here in this house chamber, I think maybe we should reflect on what do you think of the legacy of Long, if you will? Is it still there? Who I mean, are you talking to? Somebody other than you. <laughs> Closing remarks. No. <laughs> and in closing, I was closer to Mr. Earl than anyone in the state for five years. And the Earl Long I knew was a good man. The insane, uh, it's ill Mr. Long was, was, was not the man Victor knows that, knew him well too. So we knew. <coughs> but I knew Mr. Earl Long, I was closer to him for five years than anybody in the state. In fact, I was the intermediary between him and the rest of his family when they weren't speaking. He'd call me, John, tell him this. They'd say, tell Earl that, back and forth. <laughs> so I'm using them quite well. I think much, much, much good came out of the long legacy. And, all right. I'm through. <laughs> Don't. <laughs>
Governor Treen, I'll pick on you. Do you. Did you sense that there is still a, a, a legacy, if you will, of um, of long from, from well, the you charity just, hospitals? Well, you just you just heard it, Beth. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I put this man on the LSU board because I knew he would filibuster from my point of view <laughs> at any time. But uh, yes, there's a legacy. Uh, Statue of Huey Long uh, sits in front of the Capitol. Uh, the populism that he espoused was uh, uh, kept in vogue by a number of governors after that. And, uh, and I think uh, subsequent governors, I think, uh, improved on it, actually, as a matter of fact. And it was, if you define populism in the sense of being concerned for every individual in the state, yes, we had governors that I think improved upon that. And so uh, I think that's his legacy, that everybody in the state counts. And I think it's, that legacy lives today. Mm -hmm. I, I can think of two things. I, I obviously never met Huey Long. But I, I can think of two things that as long as I live, I associate with him. Uh, books for children to learn uh, became a currency in his politics and in his leadership. And what greater gift? can you give a people than to raise their children? And health care, his concern for it long before the current flap and flip and furor. Huey Long was out there fighting for people to get decent health care. Pretty powerful. For each one of you, I know you said it's a very lonely time sometime, or can be, to be governor. What was the greatest challenge in your administration? What was your greatest I, You can speak oh, now. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> what was your greatest, greatest challenge, challenge, Governor McKidd? My two, two greatest challenges were just presented to me. First was race relations. We, this was in the turmoil of the break from complete segregation. We couldn't live with that. Mississippi had gone through it, I thought, not well. Alabama was going through it. I knew George, well, George Wallace came to know him quite well. I didn't think they were handling it right. And I was determined that our state would take a different course. And we did. And historians now write that we in Louisiana handle it better than any of the deep southern states. The other thing was industrial development. And while the other governors, of course, have carried on, but we brought more industry in this state in eight years than any other southern state. And this great belt of plants from here in New Orleans, we started. We worked at it. And those, I think, were the two greatest challenges that I face. I don't think we've ever had a crook as governor. The fact that we had the code of ethics passed was just something to show we wanted to do right. I don't think it was necessary. I'm not sure that it helped any, but it demonstrated that we wanted to do right. I would think that perhaps those three things were the three challenges that I met and accepted and got pleasure Andy. You, Governor Treen, what were your greatest challenges? <clears throat> the first challenge was I had understood that my predecessor in office, the Honorable Edwin Edwards, had an apartment in the New Orleans French Quarter. And I struggled for many, many months to try to locate and find that. <laughs> One day, he told me that was all a myth. <laughs> and so that ended my search, and then I got on with the business of government after that. <laughs> I think the, uh, one of the challenges, there were, there were a lot of them, but uh, preservation of the Atchafala Basin was very controversial, had been going on for a number of years. And uh, we were able to work out 
a compromise for that, and in fact, the state achieved uh, during those years a tremendous acreage in the Chafalaya Basin to preserve it for all people for all time. That is still a, a great goal of mine, to see that the Atchafalaya Basin remains a, uh, something that we will always enjoy, all of our posterity. The other was the, the raging fight over uh, desegregation of the colleges of higher education. I agreed with Governor Edwards, who said that anybody can go to any college in this state if you are a high school graduate, but the Justice Department didn't agree with that. They had some precedents that uh, were worrisome, and we worked out something that brought peace uh, on that level until a uh, court later on upset it. Those were two of the major challenges that we faced. Thank you. And Governor Romer? Well, there were, <clears throat> there were so many. Uh, some unexpected and some I knew were there. Uh, in no particular order, I'll name two or three quickly. The financial condition of the state, I'm not blaming somebody, but we were dead last in America in terms of our bond rating. We were broke. We had no credibility, none, zero. And thanks to a lot of people, some of them here tonight in the legislature, we balanced the budget four years and raised our bond rating, one of three states in America to do it. Abortion. It was an issue I hadn't planned on. It, it was almost never discussed in the campaign. We were, we were worried about other things in our debates. And for a Methodist boy, it, it came hard. Uh, that was a tough one and divided a lot of people. Uh, education in general, I would say, was the issue that I spent more time with and more love on. And it's one I feel more deeply about. And I think Louisiana began with Children's First to make some states. Our teachers were paid the worst in America. And uh, over the course of four years with meager funds, that was no longer true. I was proud of that. I'm going to move on to another topic that you all may have some unanimity on because uh, <clears throat> it involves the media. In this museum, part of the uh, uh, involvement is the relationship between the media and politics. We have an exhibit here where you look at newscasts, you look at newspapers. What do you think about, uh, how, how is the relationship with the media in your time in office? And do you think it has the influence or too much, too little? Well, none of the papers before me when I was running. <laughs> but an unusual thing occurred. After I had beaten their choice, I made very good friend. When Mr. Jack Timmons, who published the Picky, you and I became personal friends. He would not let, I can say it now because he, did, he wouldn't let anybody up here in the Picky, you say anything bad about me because he knew I was a good man. <laughs> Mr. Timmons ran that paper like he owned it. Mr. Honey Ewing, who owned the Freeport Times, and I became close personal friends, and I almost had the same relationship with him. But that was before the Dome Stadium started getting unpopular. And uh, I began that our friendship was not quite so warm <laughs> as it was. And I had to raise taxes. Can you imagine that? My heavens. I raised the employees and the teachers and build roads and give more money to LSU than's ever given the history of the university and, and have to raise taxes. My goodness. And so my warm support but Gwenda Dwindleson. <laughs> I became not quite so close to Mr. Timms and Mr. Ewing, although I must say in their memory, they're both dead now, they remain my good friend. But I generally enjoyed a friendly relationship with the press after I, I was elected. <laughs> All right. And either of you gentlemen. Well, the nature of the press changed. I, I was elected to Congress in 1980 as a kid and, and went up there and spent seven, seven and a half years in Washington. And it was after the Watergate era. I know our president, Richard Nixon, died recently and made me think of the nature of the press changed, Beth. They became more intrusive. They, uh, personal matters became public matters. Uh, I've, it's hard to find a perfect citizen or a perfect politician. It's hard to live in a family with every move on television or, or in the papers. And I, I, feel, I feel great kinship with politicians, whether it be Edwin or, 
or Dave or, or John or Jimmy Davis for uh, the, the tough part of the public scrutiny. And you know, I, I don't lament it too much. It's, it's public information. But the nature of the press change. I have great relations with the press. I don't always agree with what they write or what they print, but uh, the, I thought they always treated me fair, at times overly fair. They often gave me the benefit of the doubt. That's a fact, and I appreciate it. But the nature of the business has changed. It's tougher now. It's not as friendly, and I don't think it's as deep. I don't think it's as good as it used to be. Governor Train, I remember when you were... <laughs> applause. <laughs> Governor Treen, I remember when you were first elected governor uh, at one of your press conferences, you said to everyone assembled, you're following me everywhere. Why are you doing this? When I was in Congress, no one paid any attention to me. Was that a surprise to you? <laughs> well, Congress, I served there as, as did uh, Buddy and, and Edwin for several years before becoming governor, and you, it, you have to fight to get some attention in the United States Congress. You have to create some sort of scandal, a furor or something like that, but the governor is watched. And I think rightly so. I enjoyed, I thought, a, a good relationship with the news media. I do think that the Louisiana news media then and now can, can be a little bit more investigative. Uh, we don't have the investigative reporting in our state that I think uh, we have on the national level. I think we could use that. If you're going to go into public office, you uh, run the risk of everything being uncovered. And uh, I only found the, the news media collectively committed only one grave error about Dave Treen. And that was to say that he was colorless and humorless <laughs> and never had a good time. <laughs> and my son David said, are they talking about you? Do you think that serving in public life is more difficult now? I mean, has it changed? Uh, if you would, as, as uh, Governor Romer indicated, uh, it is you are under great scrutiny. Is it, it, is it something that you would commend to young people to do now, to serve in public life? You're addressing this point of view to you? To me? Oh, I thought when I was elected governor in 64 that, my heavens, look at the great problems we had. Governor Davis, who is my dear friend, I just had to float a bond issue to pay the state employees their wages. Right. I said, my, my goodness, th this is horrible. That's true. But uh, now we've got problems. You do too. I don't think really any worse than they have been in the past. I think a break in the economy, the price of oil and gas doubled as everyone anticipated it would. See, we're, our economy is based on oil and gas. We've got to face up to that. And, and it goes down, we go down. Like in Michigan, when the car business goes down, their economy goes down. And we don't know, there's more gas on the surface of the soil in Louisiana, was when I was governor, than any other comparable area in the world. And when it gets back up to $10, as they said it was going to be 10 years ago, a lot of us around here are going to be rich, including the state. But now it's about $2. But I don't think our problem, Governor Edwards, any worse now than there were years ago, where they're present, and so we can see them and feel them. But we had the same problems years ago. Mr. Earl had them while he was governor. I had them. These men had them. And I don't think it's any worse now. We're just bigger. Uh, the budget never reached a billion dollars until the last year I was governor. What's it, about 10 now? 11? So we're 10 times bigger, the problems are, than there were uh, 30 years ago when I became governor. I think it's all curable. I think it's all curable. And no worse, really, comparatively speaking, than they've ever been. We, you mentioned the oil and gas business. And the history of Louisiana in modern times has certainly been so inextricably intertwined with the oil and gas business. Do you see that? Well, certainly, we've been on hard times. What is your impression of that relationship? Has it been, obviously, it's good, good at one point. What do you make of that? What do you think the measure of that as its impact on Louisiana? Do you think we need to, let me, yeah, Governor Treen, do you think we uh, just wait for oil to come back? No, obviously, we can't do that. Our onshore production and reserves have declined a great deal. 
I'm very hopeful that offshore, particularly gas provinces, uh, we had a very good sale here recently uh, offshore. Uh, and I, that, of course, will help us, not with our taxes, because we don't get any taxes from offshore. Governor Edwards tried to, and I tried to. But uh, it will give a lot of employment uh, onshore if the, if the offshore develops. But we cannot. I think it's generally accepted by all of us that we can't rely upon that anymore. We have to diversify more. We are doing that more. Tourism is becoming a much bigger thing. This great facility is going to help in that. And uh, I think, obviously, we cannot rely upon it in the future. I think we have assets beyond oil and gas, but we can't just skip over oil and gas. It's important. It is now. It has been. It will be. And some areas will grow more valuable. I don't dismiss that industry. It needs to be treated with respect, and, and it's part of our package. But I think other things will grow even more rapidly. Our geographical location in our ports, for example, I mean, we're the gateway to the world, and as the world grows smaller, international trade becomes more important. Uh, I think it's enormous potential for Louisiana. Uh, timber to turn into furniture, uh, seafood to turn into processed, finished goods. There's a variety of things that we are doing now. And these governors, uh, and Governor Edwards and Governor Jimmy Davis, have begun doing these things for the last 30 years. It just, it just takes a while from the time you plant to the time you harvest. And everybody in America wants to plant and harvest the same day. I've, I do too some days, and I, you get very impatient, but you have to plant. John, we learned that, didn't we, on the farm? You, there's a time to plant, and we ought to be planning now diversification, tourism, international trade, our ports, our location in the world, and grow good schools around it. We win that way. You know, we truly do have abundant resources in Louisiana. We are very blessed, all the natural resources you're talking about. But today, as we sit here, one third of our children live in poverty. We do not have a great legacy for education. We're at the bottom of a lot of the list. Does that trouble you? Do you think, could I have done more? Does that trouble you? If we want to face up to facts, we have nearly a third, 30% of our population are black. Doesn't mean they aren't outstanding and bright people, but for many years they lived in slavery. And they haven't completely gotten out from under that bond yet. It's still a handicap to them. But if you took the 30% of our black population, nearly a third, and put it in Minnesota, They'd have problems there too, because the bulk of our black people have not had the educational opportunities that many of the, most of the whites have had. And that puts us back down because they haven't had the educational opportunities. For example, they can't earn as much. And they say, look at old Louisiana down there. What a sorry bunch of people they are. We've got problems here they don't have. And I think on the circumstances, Edward, and I see you nodding, you agree with me. That we're not out from under slavery, and we're still getting out from under it. Give us a few more years. And the black people I know, who most of them want to help themselves and get on with it. And we've got that problem, and if we're going to be honest, and I said, well, I'm not going to say anything about it, but that's the truth. It's not fair to match up with Minnesota. Are you with me? And we get, we're working toward it. And say, oh, they don't educate their people. It's not easy. It's difficult. And we're making progress. And Governor Edmund, you've done all you could to help. These other governors have too. But let's face up to what's true and factual, what our situation is. It isn't fair to compare us to other states who haven't had the problem of slavery when most of our people were working for nothing 100 years ago or a little over. That's what we're still working out from under. And I faced up to that. And I did my part to try to cure it. As I know Governor Edwards has, and these governors have. But we've got that problem. And those of us will be completely honest, will admit it and face up to it and say, let's do the very best we can with it. And we're trying to. Let me say something to disagree with respect. Uh, we, can, we can match Minnesota. Eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart, hope to hope. 
I mean, Minnesota this February was minus 47 degrees. They got some problems, minus too. What? Minus 47 degrees. I mean, make so we, much money they can rest you in the winter. Well, I just think... <laughs> I kind of... Uh, I kind of like our chances, let me say that. And they begin... If we were to commit our passion to educating our children, folks, we can do it. But we got to face the federal judges eye to eye and say, give us a chance to do something different. There's a school in Detroit called the Newberry School. It's all black, it's all males. And you know how the principal treats those kids? Like they have no parents. If they come to school with dirty clothes, they wash them in the washer and the dryer. He feeds the hungry. He lifts those kids. We have to free our schools, fund our schools, diversify our schools, and make them put the children first. Not the school teachers, not the principals, not the bus drivers, the kids. We do that. I think that's all what we all want to do that. But the problem is still there. <laughs> Governor Treem, what do you hope when students, when the children of Louisiana come to this center, what lessons do you hope they would learn from Louisiana history? Have you thought of it? Well, I hope they will get a sense of the of obviously of the history of the state of Louisiana. And when you the more you know about uh, the past, uh, the more you know about the political roots of Louisiana, I think the more you will appreciate. Um, it's like a piece of art. When you first look at it, the more you learn about it, the more you appreciate it, you have other people point out things about it, then you love it more. And I think this will, uh, I think this facility will help a great deal in that. And I commend everybody, and uh, Lod Cook, Varco, and everybody that have made, that's made this possible. Let me add one thing about the, about the education. And I, I agree with the comments generally of both uh, of my colleagues here, uh, but in putting children first, you've got to get the teachers up there too. You've got to inspire the teachers. You've got to inspire youngsters to uh, go and get the education in college to become teachers. And our salary levels in this state for so long have been so low that it's been a discouragement to them. So in order to put children first, buddy, I have to say we've got to put the teachers up there right along with them and give them the support and the facilities we also need to have. Uh, so I think it's across the board, and I think every governor that's sitting here in this room has tried to increase funding for education. And all I can say is we need to try to do that, but we need to do it across the board elementary, secondary, higher education. You know, all of us watched... Uh, all of us watched history uh, in the making this past week with the um, memorial service of President Richard Nixon. As we saw all of the living former presidents there, it was uh, truly a moving moment. And I, I was thinking, what when each one of you were governor, what was your relationship with Washington, with the presidency? What, what was your, do you remember anything particularly, Governor McKithen? Well, first of all, I met Lyndon Johnson and immediately fell under his charm. Russell Long had warned me about Lyndon Johnson. He said, if you want to stay mad at him, don't be around him because he's the greatest that ever lived. And I learned to like <laughs> Lyndon Johnson. Uh, history hadn't been real kind to him. Of course, it wasn't kind to Nixon either. Now, what did you ask me? What was you... <laughs> did, you, did you get any advice? You the man. <laughs> or give any advice to Washington? I mean, did, how often were you called as a governor of the state? Well, we were in the midst of that segregation thing, and President Johnson sent word to me that a number of times if I didn't do something, he was. I knew they'd call the National Guard out in, in Little Rock. There were not many armed forces in this state. I wanted to command them, not him. 
And uh, <laughs> we had a mayor here in Baton Rouge, Woody Dumas, passed away a short time ago, dear friend. Every time we'd have a heavy dew, he'd start calling me to call out the guard, call out the guard, call out the guard. <laughs> and for a long, a long time there, I was kind of a commanding general. But my relationship, my relationship with President Johnson was very friendly. I remember when uh, the second term amendment thing was up, and I said, it really wasn't my idea, but I fell into it. He told me one day, he said, John, I hope your thing passes. He said, if it'll help you more to come out for it, I will. If it'll help you more to come out against it, I will, he said. <laughs> uh, and I had a, I had a friend, I didn't, I didn't know President Nixon well. I didn't remember meeting with him. But uh, President Johnson was a kind of man that those of us in Louisiana, you just couldn't help. And with my falling in love with Russell Long had warned me about it. But I didn't know President Nixon. I knew him and met him, but didn't know him about that. Gentlemen, we have just begun this conversation, and I hope this is just the beginning of uh, a history that we can recount and perhaps sit down together again. We're out of time for this particular conversation. I want to thank each one of you for being on this forum this evening. It has been most entertaining and enlightening. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'd like to close. I was reading Robert Quinn Warren's uh, book the other day, All the King's Men, the wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book. And uh, his last closing comments in All the King's Men were, and now we shall go out of the house and go into the convulsion of the world, out of history into history, and the awful responsibility of time. And certainly as we begin this creation of this new center, uh, and we all can learn from history. Uh, it has been a pleasure to be with you, the audience here tonight, and you gentlemen. And at home, we hope you enjoyed being with us. We thank you so very much. Good night. Everybody.